The year is 3069, and due to many pressures, like overpopulation, climate change, and economic collapse, millions of people have flocked to the Red Planet in search of opportunities. Thanks to the collaboration of some of Earth's most powerful nations and corporations, Mars was partly terraformed and its atmosphere oxygenated, making it habitable. Today, we're going to be making a language for one of these Martian colonies. But before we begin, don't forget to subscribe if you find this episode interesting, and join us on our journey to help you create audacious and unique conlangs. Anyway, let's begin. What attracted so many people to Mars was the promise of getting rich and escaping the toxic wasteland that Earth now is. Upon arrival, many decided to work in the lucrative mining towns, which initially fueled the Martian economy. And it wasn't just people from one country. All of these nations, who in 3069 are now global superpowers, sent some of their citizens over to Mars for economic, but mainly strategic purposes. And climate refugees from these countries also made their way to Mars. But notice the fact that America, which is today one of the biggest economies, is not on the list. Well, this is mainly due to the fact that most of America was unaffected by climate change, and many Americans set up companies on Mars which harvest tax from the inhabitants. This is not to say, however, that America will have a small impact on the language, as you'll soon see. Now, despite the fact that Mars has been terraformed, people are still pretty scared about leaving their colonies due to irrational fears about radiation poisoning. And as a result, these colonies function pretty much like city-states. Due to these fears, the authorities are forced to maintain huge domes around these colonies. But because of this isolation, a lot of infrastructure is needed to stay in contact with the other colonies. And sometimes, these fail, leaving the colonies unable to contact each other for potentially hundreds of years. Today, we'll be making a conlang for the very creatively named Camp 5 which has a notoriously unreliable communication system. This means that it hasn't really had any contact with the outside world for hundreds of years. These are the proportions of different nationalities which live on Camp 5, and these are the languages which they spoke on Earth. Now, instead of being a Creole language, due to the amount of diversity it will most likely be a mixed language, which means that it's created by a group of multilinguals, combining instead of subduing each other's languages. Initially, the Martian settlers will continue to speak their native languages, but they'll soon begin to adopt elements of each other's languages. But to begin with, we need a common language, or lingua franca, for the settlers to speak. Now, we could use English, but that would be really boring, as it already serves the role of the lingua franca today. So, instead, let's use Indonesian. This won't, however, be very noticeably Indonesian, as our Martian conline will be highly influenced by the languages of the other settlers. So let's get conlanging. Now, for mixed and occasionally Creole languages, I like to use a method called ACTS, which stands for Add, Cut, then Simulate. Now, for the Add stage, we simply add language A's phonology to language B's phonology. I recommend putting all of these sounds into an IPA table. For step two, 
Cutting. Your job is to get rid of as many unique or rare sounds from both A and B. Cutting is really a balance between taking too few sounds and ending up with an unrealistic language, or taking too many sounds and finding that you've made a really boring language. Now, once you've done this, you'll end up at a stage called C. C will most likely be a combination of the most popular sounds in A combined with the most popular sounds in B. But you're not done yet. Whilst the sounds in C might be good enough for some purposes, if you want to make your language more realistic, you need to undergo step 3, simulation. Now, sounds in languages generally undergo two processes, mergers and splits. This, as you probably already guessed, is when a sound either develops two variations or two distinct phonemes merge into one. But don't worry, these changes are reasonably regular, and they're usually the same amount of mergers and splits, and vice versa. I recommend making at least 10. Now, these sound changes can apply to the sound in all contexts, and be unconditional, or they can only apply to the sounds in certain situations, and be conditional. Like in this change. Once you've completed this simulation phase, you'll end up with D, your language's phonology. After following this system, this is the phonology which we're going to use for our language. Now instead of just using A and B for inspiration, I used quite a few influences. Although, when you're doing this, it's important to cut enough sounds out of the languages as possible. Now, there is an important distinction which I'd like to go over. Phonemics versus phonetics. Phonetics is to do with the actual pronunciation of words. Whereas phonemics is to do with the speaker's perception of the sounds. For example, these sounds have merged in my conline. And whilst the speakers haven't noticed it, the V has actually shifted slightly to become this sound. The speakers, however, won't view this as a change of sound, and rather a different pronunciation. Anyway, now let's look at the vowels. For the vowels, let's make three different vowel heights, and I'm going to make these vowels. Now, I'm not sure if it's entirely naturalistic to not have the O, but I'm going to do it anyway. Let's also add some nasal vowels in place of pre-nasalized stops. This change will be conditional and will only affect words like this. In all the other situations, the nasality will just be scrapped. And to spice things up a bit, let's add some rhotic coloured vowels. These could be the result of American influence. Rhotic coloured vowels occur when the R sort of gets squashed into the vowel in front of it. And it's found in words like this North American pronunciation of butter. And due to the fact that Cantonese, Mandarin, Yoruba, Igbo and a few other languages on the list have them, I think we'd better include some tones. Let's just get rid of this one though. As you can see here, our tones will act on the whole words instead of just individual syllables. However, over time, these tones have begun to be used more like stress indicators. They're still cool though, so we're keeping them. Now on to phonotactics. I feel that the importance of good phonotactic constraints is often underestimated. Phonotactics affects the whole aesthetic of a language and can help prevent an a posteriori language, that is, a language developed from existing languages, from feeling too much like its source language. They also help languages seem more naturalistic, 
and give them a distinctive feel. So these will be our phony tactic constraints for the onset. And these will be our constraints for the coder. We'll also have these consonant clusters, which will, according to our syllable structure, always be placed at the beginning of the syllable. However, these rules don't exactly encompass all of our sounds. Rotic coloured vowels and nasal vowels function like consonants. This is why the coda is not required for words which include them. Now on to the morphology. Our language will have a nominative accusative alignment, SVO word order, and will be fusional with a few polysynthetic elements. But what about verbs? This is how the verb biqar, meaning to go, is conjugated. Now this verb is derived from Indonesian and illustrates how the language uses non-concatenative morphology. All this means is that the roots of the verb change, as can be seen here. And for the tenses, there's a past and a future, formed by the mesoclitics the and lu. Now, there are actually a plethora of other tenses like this, due to the fact that these markings are derived from adverbs. This is how the is attached to verb roots, and this is how lu is attached to the verbs. There are also many aspects, as well as an imperative mood. Here's the suffix nyilar. It essentially acts as a negation marker, and what makes it special is that it's not usually fused with the other suffixes. Now on to nominals. So, all the nouns in our language will automatically be in the unmarked nominative case. But this noun isn't actually correct. We need to add the animacy marking. And since this is the word for a child, an animate entity, it will be marked with the suffix al. We could also make this noun plural, and I've made a nice system of reduplication for this. I've also put the noun in the genitive case here. Now this is the grammatically correct form, but speakers often unknowingly slur the words, so it can sound more like this. There are a few other cases, like the oblique, genitive, and locative, but I'll cover them all in an episode of Martian Stories. Anyway, since you watched to the end, here are a few sentences in the Martian language of Camp 5. Anyway, that's all for this week. See you next time for our episode on the languages of Colombia. Bye.